Welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Right, here we go. What you think about. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome back to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm so thrilled you can be with us. If you liked our opening song, it's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band, and it features Maya Dore, and you can download that on any of your favorite platforms there. For those of you that are new to our show, Alzheimer's Speaks Radio is about sound news, not just sound bites. We like to have real conversations so that we can get to the heart and the soul of what's working and what's not when it comes to dementia care. And our goal is to raise all voices, big and small, from those diagnosed to those that care and serve them, to advocates and researchers. Today is a live show, and if you'd like to call in with any questions, you can do that at 323-870-4602. That's 323 323- Eight seven zero four six zero two. Keep in mind, we have quite the panel today, so um, I will try to pull you in. But again, I can't. Uh, I can't promise we'll get there. I also want to thank our listeners. I love you guys to death. Uh, your likes, your clicks, your shares on Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter have really helped grow our community base. And so, for that, I I can't thank you enough. And I know you're going to enjoy the conversation today because we're going to be talking about. Building a Care Circle of Support, and how, how that is developed and how it works for everybody in terms of lifting them. And it's a perfect time to be having this conversation because November is National Caregivers Month along with National Alzheimer's Month. Now, on some of our past shows that we've just recently had, everything is archived, so you can always go back and look, but I just want to mention a couple We just did one with the Dementia Friendly Airports Working Group, which is fascinating. How much progress they're making all around the world to make it easier to travel when all the sanctions are lifted and it's safe to do so. We also had a group on talking about leveraging theater and the arts uh, to help with awareness. And we had an author and a movie director um, Suska wrote the book Wonders in Dementia Land, which is just a fabulous, fabulous uh, book that's being made into a film. She also has a podcast you can find called Dementia Land on YouTube. And upcoming on Thanksgiving, we're going to be telling Bob Savage's story of dementia. He's been living with it for a period of time and talk about his advocacy and so forth. The following week, we are going to have the... Um, Let's see, the Movie and Picture and Television Foundation on, who serves uh, people living with dementia, as well as the CEO of Mind VR, and Mind is M-Y-N-D, which has a virtual reality company. We're going to be learning more about that. I also want to invite people to join Arthur's Memory Cafe this Wednesday it doesn't make any any difference where you live in the world. Just reach out to me. We meet at 1 o'clock Central Time, and that is virtual, and you are more than welcome to join us. And then I was just talking with uh, some folks at Dementia Action Alliance, and this Thanksgiving, they are going to be doing kind of a drop-in open house. It's virtual, starting at 11 a.m. and going till 7 p.m. Eastern because they know there's a lot of people that are alone during this time. And let's see, they are also doing some free online programs and you can find out about both by going to daanow.org. That's daanow.org or daanow.org. 
And the last I want to shout out to Coral Health because they are allowing people to download their free app, uh, Music First, and also Coral Faith during COVID. So please take advantage of that. The Memory Cafe directory, if you're looking where to connect with with, um, early to mid uh, dementia and their care partners, uh, check that out. There's like over 900 uh, cafes listed, but there's probably about 100 or so that are doing virtual now, and anybody is welcome to those. And then I'd be amiss if I didn't mention our launch of Dementia Map. Dementia Map has been a goal of mine for 36 years. It's a global resource directory. We just started on the 10th. Everyone is invited to be able to tap into that, and we are just going to build that by word of mouth. And I know it works because that's that's how I do everything um, in my world. Uh, so I am going to play one last thing, and that is the foot bar walker, and then we'll be right back to introduce our fascinating panel uh, who is caring beautifully for a loved one. Introducing the life-changing Foot Bar Walker. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The Foot Bar Walker revolutionized my care of George. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. The Foot Bar Walker opens and closes just like a standard walker. The only thing that is different is the top bar and the foot bar. Does that ever make a difference? Does someone you love use a walker? Do they struggle to get up from a seated position? Are you a caregiver dealing with physical pain and stress as you help your patient? The Foot Bar Walker was designed to assist not only the patient, but also the caregiver. Patients have more control standing up, and no lifting from the caregiver is required. See how it works at thefootbarwalker.com. That's thefootbarwalker.com. Peggy, would you recommend the Foot Bar Walker? Do I ever? I would not be in the health that I'm in today at this age had it not been for the the foot bar walker. Well, let's get to our show, Building a Team to Care for a Loved One with Dementia. First, I'm going to introduce Jim Russell. He is a caregiver for his 54-year-old daughter, Lynn, who has young onset Alzheimer's and is now living in an assisted living since October of 2018. Jim is a widower with two younger children and five grandchildren whose families also care for both Lynn and himself. So welcome, Jim. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you, Lori. Well, thank you. I'm going to go and just introduce everybody one at a time, and then we'll get into our questions. Next, I want to introduce uh, Jim's daughter, uh, Pam. Uh, Pam, and I'm going to try not to crucify her name here, Berano. <laughs> And uh, (laughs) Pam, if I killed it, you just uh, correct me when I'm done with your intro here. Pam is Lynn's younger sister of five years, and she has been a social worker for youth with severe disabilities, a K-12 through teacher and an administrator, and oversees programs for English learners and disadvantaged youth. She's currently a writer for Curriculum Associates, Inc. So welcome, Pam, and go ahead and correct me on your name there. <laughs> <laughs> Full name is Pam Russell, the head I know, and thanks for having me here today. Great, thank you. Um, next, I'm going to go ahead and introduce Simon. And Simon is 23 years old. And he is one of Lynn's sons, uh, who is a twin, and he also has worked in assisted living. He is in his second year of nursing and has written a paper on dementia care uh, in in other countries. And he and his brothers have provided support for his mom since before she was diagnosed, while she was still living at home with her three sons. So um, thank you so much for joining us, Simon, today. I appreciate you coming. Yeah, thank you, Lori. I'm glad to be here. Wonderful. Uh, Next, I'm going to go to Edith. And Edith is a close friend of Lynn's uh, and has been for years. And she's actually the one that alerted the family that there was something seriously going on with Lynn. And Edith is a field marketing manager for Amazon's delivery service uh, partners program. And she lives in Oregon with her husband and her black lab, Sally, who's 12 and a half years old. So welcome, Edith. How are you doing? 
Great, great. Thanks so much for having me on the show, Lori. Looking forward to the conversation. Thank you for joining us. And last but certainly not least is Mina. Mina White is the Director of Operations at Aegis Living Home, and uh, which, is, which has 124 apartments where Lynn lives in memory care. And Mina recently moved into caregiving after a career as an executive in retail management. And I can uh, say right offhand, because I've done uh, some speaking at some of the Regis facilities, uh, what a, or uh, the Regis, Aegis facilities, um, what a beautiful communities they are and what wonderful programming um, I have seen firsthand there. So welcome, Mina. Thank you, and good morning to you. Well, great. I really appreciate everybody taking this time. I know it's not easy to corral this many people together all at once. So I'm going to start with Jim. And um, Jim, I want to talk to you about how COVID-19 and the isolation has really affected your daughter. She was one of the most active people, if not the most active people in the Aegis facility at the time uh, COVID hit when she had to go into isolation. Uh, all the stress hormones that are released uh, in isolation began to affect her. She had more anxiety, tension deficit, panic. And so she was just more depressed, and I was very concerned about it because she was left alone a lot, even though she was touched 10 times a day by the staff at Aegis. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a difficult a difficult process that a lot of communities um, have been struggling with is how do you keep people safe and, and still serve them. So it's been real tricky. So I can't wait to get to Mina to talk a little bit more on that. Did, did you um, use technology at all in, in terms of uh, trying to provide your daughter care during this time, Jim? We've, we've been trying to add as many technology devices as we could. We started with, of course, the TV, and then uh, Echo Dot allowed us to drop in on her, and then uh, that didn't work as well when we were trying to talk on the phone, so we went to a Facebook portal so we could have messengers. We, uh, she had trouble hanging on to a telephone, so we scheduled it with the caregivers, and uh, now we have uh, the ability for her to drop in on us, and we can drop in on her in terms of sound. So uh, then there are a number of other uh, kind of Zoom meetings for, for us, and they have a brain room even at the Aegis facility. So we've used a lot of technology. Oh, that's fantastic. I had uh, one man in my uh, memory cafe, and what he did was he set up an iPad and gave it to the staff. They just had to set it up once, and then he could beam in anytime he wanted to check on her. And it worked out wonderful. She didn't have to touch anything. She didn't have to do anything. And neither did the staff. And uh, so technology can really, be, can really be our friend. Now, in terms of obstacles with, uh, with technology, a lot of times we'll have those types of issues as well. And you said you kind of went from one to another. Can you say why you, you kind of switched in terms of, of types of technology that you were using? Well, we had the idea of dropping in on them any time we could, but Aegis's policy is that uh, they don't want anybody outside the staff to be able to drop in visually on an, any resident that's in her apartment. So we went with the Echo Dot to check in with her by voice, and then we have a phone for the Facebook portal so we can set up whenever a video chat occurs. But we had to have uh, people trained, uh, their care staff, on how to turn that on, how to work. Uh, Lynn would uh, have the ability to turn it on and off with her fingers if she reached out to try to touch our face. So uh, we had to be able to schedule a number of different things to, uh, to be able to make it work effectively. And, but of course, when we had a linkage, we had to make sure that their phones linked to Lynn's phone and Lynn's phone linked to their phones. But Aegis staff has just been marvelous in making sure that we post things on the walls and everything so that we could make this project work. Oh, fantastic, fantastic. Have you tried any other traditional ways in terms of uh, trying to entertain her? 
Well, when we found out that uh, we could get an, an exercise bicycle and put it in a room, we did that. We uh, had one put together in the basement, and it was uh, dragged up by the concierge. And any time the Lynn gets anxiety or uh, gets concerned about something, she'll often, even at my suggestion to school, would sit down on that, that uh, bicycle, which really was not that expensive and assembled uh, by uh, the retail sales company. She just gets on and pedals as hard as she can. And uh, we bought our foot basin for warmer baths. We put uh, the um, uh, picture book together for her to share with family and friends and people on the, on the staff there. So we just had a, a lot of different ways that we could get her entertained. Oh, wonderful. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with Maria's Place, but um, it can be good for families and, as well as communities. But they have all different kinds of um, activities, and they break down videos, how to do them. They have shopping lists, or you can order them direct as well. And I know that a lot of communities have even tapped into some of those things. But, again, it just depends on the, the level of functioning you know, an individual is at. Um, have you seen the technology be beneficial not only to family members but staff as well in terms of giving care to Lynn? Well, it's been it's been transforming for us because once we started communicating that we were using the technology, uh, we added a number of people who could help give her care for it through uh, the online systems. So her friends from high school began to find out about it. Her friends from uh, her working area, Edith is an example, just helped spread the word on people about that. And so they can share phone chats with her and video chats. She doesn't have to talk to her dad all the time. She could talk to her friends and immediately open up with a whole new set of long-term memories. And then they give me all sorts of ideas. They say, have you thought of her birthday? Well, no, I hadn't thought of that. Well, now one of those people has organized a Zoom conference for us for her birthday over a couple of days. So it's just helped us in terms of communicating with the care team, with increasing the number of people who are giving support and giving us ideas and giving Lynn more to do. It's been, it's been marvelous. Wonderful. Um, I'm going to go with uh, with your flow, and I'm going to go to Edith now and uh, talk to her because she was the one who kind of spotted things. So, Edith, you know, you were the one that really first recognized some unusual things were happening. What types of, of things uh, were you seeing? Thanks, Lori. Well, I'm not sure that I was the first. I think that um... – Lynn's parents and maybe her siblings also saw some things that seemed to be unusual. But there was one evening that we all went out and uh, we went out to dinner back when we could do those things. And Lynn seemed a little disoriented. She couldn't remember if she had driven her car to the restaurant or not. Um, But the most striking thing was that she would say a word that sounded like the real word, but it wasn't, it was a, it was a made up word. And it was like her brain couldn't make the full connection to say the word, but, but she knew it well enough. And it, it, um, it really raised an alarm for me because my father-in-law passed away from, uh, from Lewy body dementia. And I, it just felt exactly the same when when he was in his early stages um and so i actually didn't have a i mean i've lynn and i have been friends for 30 years but i actually had never met her parents or siblings and the and i didn't have any contact information but the only thing i knew was that her brother was a professor at western washington university so thankfully google takes you to Western Washington, and I found his email address, and I emailed him, and I said, look, this is what I observed. I don't want to sound off alarm bells, but I, uh, this is kind of what it reminds me of. Uh-huh. That must have been a, a difficult call to make, you know, because you're trying to balance things out with not interfering, but yet caring for someone's well-being as well. Um, how did you how did you counsel Lynn um, to to seek more help when when I would imagine there was probably some resistance at first? That's pretty pretty common. Or or did she just accept it for what it was and and uh, go forward? 
Oh, no. And I'm smiling. You can't see me because we're on the radio, but I'm smiling because <laughs> the thing that we all love about Lynn is that she is um, probably one of the best critical thinkers I've ever met, super smart, super fierce, um, and, you know, very independent. So I, I certainly didn't bring that direct concern to her uh, saying, hey, I, I wonder if this is the beginning of Alzheimer's because I'm not a doctor. But what I did say to her, and we took some, um, as, as Jim said, Lynn is, uh, has been very active. So we took a long walk one day, and um, I said, Lynn, you know, I'm just, I'm noticing some things, and I, you know, have you looked into it? And she said, yeah, you know, I've been to my doctor. These are just memory loss and um, it's normal for menopause, you know, and I, I'm not, I'm not really worried about it. And, you know, I think when you get into your fifties, you definitely have memory loss and there's not one of us who can say that that hasn't happened to them. And so I said, I, I, I sort of said, well, you know, I, I mean, if it was your child, Lynn, behaving that way, then I would want, then you would look into it. You would do everything you could. So just allow your parents to intercede and um, just do some follow-ups. If it's nothing, then it's nothing, and then you've just spent a few hours at the doctor. So I would say I was cautiously optimistic, but that, you know, that little voice that drives your instinct was saying, no, I don't believe it. I, I think that there's something really going on. Because again, if you know Lynn, she's got a strong personality and and always just a great logical thinker. So to behave outside of that was, was just really uncharacteristic. Yeah, that, that could be a, a tough one. I know with my mom had dementia for 30 years and she started having symptoms in her mid fifties and the doctors back then, this was 36 years ago, uh, blew it off to um, menopause. And my mom would say, this ain't my girlfriend's menopause. <laughs> she she knew something was different, but she even going to the doctors um, back then couldn't get any other answers. And so was, mm-hmm. was frustrated with it and, and just plugging along. As a friend, um, you've been able to see the progression of the disease. How has that affected your experience and interaction with Lynn, or hasn't it? I mean, it's a great question. Uh, and, and, you know, we have a very strong, um, closely knit group of friends. We all worked at Microsoft together in our early to mid 20s. So those were very formative years. And so those friendships are very strong. And so, um, y- you know, I think that some of us have had a very hard time talking, calling her, talking to her, and seeing. Um, the decline. And I, I mean, I would say that there are times when, you know, I really do have to um, feel strong to, to call her, to talk to her, to be, um, to, to not let the sadness take over, but really focus on what she can do. And as Jim was referring to earlier, that, that modern technology is phenomenal. Um, I remember one day I came over, it was, um, it was this past spring, so probably eight, May, April, May, um, and I brought some lilacs over, and they were so beautiful, but I couldn't give them to her in person, right? That they, you know, it was just at the beginning of the lockdown, everything was conscientious, so I had to leave them for her, and then her caregiver called with Lynn, you know, to show me the the joy that she was experiencing, but that was super hard because we both share this love of out, outdoors and gardening. Um, so, yeah, so I, experiencing it is sad, and it, and it does take a lot of, of um, just emotional toll. Um, but how can I not? I mean, I, I love Lynn in any stage, and, and she's my dear, dear friend in my heart. Mm, that's so nice. I, I know a lot of people – walk away and, and push away disease because of discomfort. And um, I know on my journey myself, I just found great blessings wrapped in a very strange package 
you know, in terms of how to look at things differently, how to love more unconditionally, how to be less judgmental and more open um, in terms of, of what I'm seeing and feeling and not having to not having to fit into a perfect world anymore because dementia is anything but perfect and still being able to find the beauty and enjoy, but adding in COVID with that, it's got to be really difficult because at least, you know, with my mom, I I was able to see her and touch her and, and, and talk or communicate in whatever fashion that, that was as she progressed. Um, But COVID makes it all so much more complicated in terms of, the roles that we play and, and um, you know, how, how that feels for, for all of us. Um, how, do, how, how have you handled feelings of avoidance when conversations or interactions are, are hard? Um, because there's, we do have those times where it's just, it's just difficult or you're not in the space or maybe you're doing fine, but somebody with you isn't, in that same space when you're with Lynn? Yeah, I mean, I don't, I, I mean, I can very easily uh, avoid those feelings of avoidance, no no pun intended, because I, I just feel so deeply for her, especially the fact that she is shut inside. And I, again, um, she's someone who loves the outdoors who would always be up for a, a jog walk. So I think it's so, it, for me at least, it's just easy to say, like, how can I not, how can I not call her? How can I not talk to her? Because, oh, sorry, that's my dog and someone doesn't know her. Um, I, how can I not sort of empathize because I'm so much better off, right? I'm going to be able to get off the, uh, the the phone and continue with my life, but not Lynn. Sorry, I'm going to go ahead and go on mute yeah. because I don't want to distract. Oh, okay, that's fine. Thank you so much. I'm going to go to uh, Simon next. Um, Simon, again, is uh, one of Lynn's sons. And so I'd like to have a conversation in here uh, from you, Simon, on what kind of care did you and your brothers uh, brothers provide your mom uh, before she was diagnosed um, if you were seeing some things going on or did it not start until after she was diagnosed? Yeah, so um, we, we saw a lot of little things kind of leading up to the diagnosis that kind of scared us, but we also just assumed that they might be things to do with like forgetfulness and other like issues maybe related to her age. I don't think any of us wanted to accept that she could be uh, diagnosed with Alzheimer's. So some of the stuff we did for her was uh, we helped her with like organization because a lot of the things that we started to notice early on were things like misplacing her keys, uh, constantly losing her phone, um, never being able to remember passwords for the different like accounts that she owned, like her bank account, Amazon, Netflix even. So Mm -hmm. we like, we set up cabinets and labeled them for different things like her keys and her wallets. And we put like a beeper on her, I think it's called a tile on her phone and her keys so that she could beep them when she misplaced them. Okay. And it was just, it was just like little stuff like that. And uh, we also helped try to contact friends and get her to, Uh, go on walks and see people because she started to really um, confine herself to the house, which as Edith was talking about was quite unusual. She loved being outdoors and going on long walks. And so we were worried about that. And we started reaching out to people and seeing if they would come and talk to her and go on walks. Oh, nice. Now you were, I believe like 20 when all this started and you had a younger brother who was 15 what kind of impact mm-hmm. did that have on on your life? Because that had to have been a big change too, and kind of a somewhat of not not necessarily a full role reversal, but you're you're feeling some of the effects of doing things that you didn't think you were probably going to have to do at that age. Yeah, yeah. So it it started getting like kind of bad, uh, like the end of my senior year in high school. And when she was actually diagnosed, 
uh, it was right before I left for college. Um, so it was the first time I was going to be away from home, away from my brothers, uh, away from my mom. Um, so that was really rough on me. Uh, I don't know. When I when I went up to college, I was like constantly fighting feelings that I should be at home. I should be caring for my mom. I should be there with her. But she insisted that I leave for school and she wanted me to make progress in my academic career. Um, mm-hmm. So, so that was really tough. I don't know, partly because of my feelings for wanting to be around my mom and also just because I was separated from that kind of support network I had with my mom and also my brothers. And I didn't know how to cope with those feelings without them being around, especially because I talked to my mom about everything in my life. She was always so open and always so accepting and, and kind. Um, so I really struggled my first year up up at Western Washington. Um, and I wound up coming back home, I believe in the spring quarter of that year, just to kind of reset and spend time with her and figure out where I wanted to go from there. Yeah, that, that would be very difficult to do. And there would be a you know, a mixture of wanting to get on with your life and and probably some guilt of not being there and feeling that you should and that you want to. And then, like you said, just, you know, you being in a new space and time and not having that normal support that you'd have, and then you add the illness on top of it, that's a, that's a pretty big weight to be carrying around. Did you find, um, Mm -hmm that other uh, college students, were you able to open up to any of them or was it just a uncomfortable thing that you didn't, didn't want people to know about? Yeah. So I, it was, it was quite uncomfortable at the time, but um, I, I had one person that I was able to open up to and my, my best friend since elementary school, his name is Gabe. Um, he had an aunt uh, that also passed away from early onset Alzheimer's Um and he was really good about kind of checking in on me and, and provoking me and seeing how I was doing because I would also really bottle myself up and kind of just back myself away from friends and social activities and wind up in my room. And he would always go and talk to me and get me out of the house and we'd go on walks or play ping pong. And he was really sweet about the whole thing. And he, he talked to his parents and, they they talked to Lynn and they would bring her food. We had a family dinner with them, so that was a really nice kind of uh, additional oh. support from him. Really nice, yeah. Because a lot of a lot of young kids don't have that extra connection and tie-in, so that was that was wonderful. How how mm-hmm. did things change with your mom in, since COVID and since you know lockdown was was um, mandated? Um, did you notice any differences in her? Oh, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, like like Jim was talking about, she was, like, probably one of the most active people in Aegis. Like, I would go and visit her in between classes from Central, and she would never be in her room. She was always doing an activity there, doing dance, learning Spanish, all kinds of stuff. And once once COVID happened and the lockdown started, it was just, she was stuck in her room a lot more. She didn't have kind of that way to interact and keep those neurological pathways open. I just, it seems like she started to decline a lot faster. It was really, really scary. Like the first couple of times I called her when she was in lockdown, I noticed like a big difference. She, she couldn't stay focused on, on the call, she'd look around the room and ask where I was because she could see me and assumed I was there and mm-hmm. want to hug me. Um, so that was that was really hard. Um, that was really hard. And yeah. sometimes it was it was scary for me to to call her, uh, and I'd feel super guilty because I'd catch myself, I don't know, thinking that I couldn't do it because how hard it was on me and then I would get mad at myself because that's not fair to Lynn. All she wants to do is see me, not fair to my mom. So that was something I struggled with. Um, 
Yeah, yeah, which is very normal at all ages, but but being younger makes it even even more complicated. What what do you have um, for suggestions for other other kids uh, who may be coping with a, a parent who has a form of dementia? Um, I I think I'm really still uh, learning how to cope, but I really do think it helps um, to find a support network in any any kind of way that you can and, and find people to open up with and, and share the experience with. Um, I wound up uh, going to therapy when I was up at Western and that, that really helped me um, just being able to talk through kind of my mental state um, with somebody else, as well as being able to open up to my friend and having my family, my grandpa, my aunt, everyone that's close to us, um, and just being able to talk to them as well as just trying to spend as much time uh, mm-hmm. with the person as you can because, I mean, every time I do, I mean, it can be hard once the time is over, but it's so nice um, in the moment, and I'm avoiding it just winds up hurting you even more, I feel. Yeah. There is a group called Us Against Alzheimer's, and they have a youth group, and they do fabulous work. They have groups for veterans and Latinos and African-American and women, but they do have a youth group there. That's something you might want to check into. They do a a fabulous, fabulous job um, with all kinds of of resources and things there. Well, I want to thank you for um, sharing so much with us. I'm going to uh, get... uh, Mina in uh, next since you had uh, you know we we touched base about uh, the community. So uh, Mina, how have things changed since COVID has hit in terms of you know how's it affected your residents and how you care for them? That's got to be difficult. Well, one of the things is that when COVID pandemic hit. Um, a lot of the news stories were very um, frightening and scary about long-term communities and Mm -hmm. um, the learning lessons that those communities had in dealing with families and residents and how to protect them. So I think that that was one of the biggest learning lessons that Aegis took is first and foremost, one of the things that we haven't spoken about is just how residents view personal protective equipment. Mm -hmm. So one of the things is that not only masking up, but gowning up as needed and wearing face shields, um, sometimes that's scary for residents with dementia, seeing those types of things. So just getting used to that in itself was something that was difficult for the residents. Um, But then we started doing silly things like um, maybe decorating our face shields or doing funny things with our eyes when we were talking with our residents and just kind of making fun of the situation um, and making light heart of it, but letting um, the residents know that this was something to protect them, which I think first and foremost, that's scary in itself when you're still trying to, um, residents with dementia, try and read your face and all the attributes that um, you're showcasing when you're showing love to them. And so that's one of the the things that was difficult to get past. Um, Secondly, when you're doing life enrichment for residents, when there is a group of people, you're um, basically helping many residents at one time, and you're able to do group activities, pull people in for different things that they may like. Um, One of the things that we've had to do in Aegis is actually um, rise up to the challenge of how are we going to make a targeted plan for every single resident in our community. Um, And what we've found is that there is no longer just somebody that does care, just somebody that does life enrichment, just somebody that does culinary or maintenance or housekeeping. All of a sudden, all of our roles were all of those things Um, because we had to make an individual targeted plan, like I said, for a single person. Um, And then with that, how do we include technology, which really wasn't included that much in our programming? How Mm -hmm. do we include that with our residents? So with Lynn, 
specifically, one of the things, and you've heard this across the board with everybody that's spoken today, is exercise and being outdoors was a tremendous, tremendous part of her life. So one of the things specifically for her is when she gets up in the morning and gets ready for the day, the first thing we have is her first activity of the day is some form of exercise. And um, many people share in this with her. And it's not only riding her bike in the room, but it is out on outside walks. If we can find a way to go outside and it's not too blustery out there, um, or going to our exercise room, making sure it's clear and disinfected. And she has a person in the community, and it's not always a life enrichment person. Sometimes it's a maintenance person. Sometimes it's a care person that will walk with her up to um, the activity room or wherever in the community there is a space where nobody's at and exercise with her for an hour. Okay, mm-hmm. And then also with her, um, specifically, she needs to be doing things. One of the things that Lynn has really kept intact was her personality of being a helper. Um, she is so helpful, and she sees things. She sees things and is so empathic to what she sees the other residents go through. And she will say, hey, I see somebody's doing this or I see um, that this is difficult, or I see a staff member struggling with such. So pulling her into doing things even the staff does. So, for instance, I'll say in the day, Lynn, do you want to help me um, move an apartment? Lynn, do you want to help me with um, setting up the um, different areas for activity that I'm going to do later individually with each person and finding things for her to do. And she's super smart. She's so smart. She'll say, Mina, is this busy work or is this like real work? That's what she asks me. <laughs> Cause she knows, she knows if I'm putting her on a task, it's busy work. And she's so um, funny about it. And then the other thing is creating that time every day to use technology to call her family and friends. And that's just those three things are such a small piece of her day um, and only takes a few hours of her day. So it's really every single time with maybe 20 people in a day creating moments with her. That's what it's all about with Alzheimer's dementia is creating a moment in time. And for Lynn specifically, it's getting her out of her anxiety. Mm-hmm. Because the number one for resi- question for residents that they don't articulate, but I think is the root of what they're really asking is what's happening next. Yep. Like, yep. <laughs> like I don't know what my next move is. I also know that things are different and I also know this feels uncomfortable. What is the next step for me? And they don't they don't articulate that, but that's what I feel coming from our mm-hmm. residents. Yeah, and that so, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and so it's really about creating a moment for them all the time and you have to dive into what they're going through in that moment. Sometime for Lynn, um, it's talking about those things and trying to articulate through those things with her. And other times it is totally moving away from that anxiety and redirecting Mm -hmm. and not talking about what's giving her the anxiety and sharing in a fun moment and creating a different sense of reality for her in that moment. Really redirection. I, I have to like give it to our care staff here and all of our Um, staff members that work here and being able to um, redirect with the dementia is a gift Um, and also one of the most challenging things to do because as soon as you walk out the door that's not what you're doing in your daily life somebody says that's a great purple shirt and you're wearing a, a red shirt you wouldn't say Oh, thank you. You would say, no, that's not purple. It's red, you know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So creating that moment and being in the moment with what the resident's reality is, I think is a real gift. And also at times, a lot of things, a lot of times what we have to do with Lynn. Yeah. I love how you brought up the PPE and because that is a scary, 
scary thing and a big change. And for some older uh, adults, I've heard that they it brings them back to the days of polio, where you know they couldn't they couldn't go out of their house, and um, right. you know some very scary times. So I like the decorating and I like using the nonverbals and and trying to find some humor in it. I also want to really point out because this is something I noticed when I I was on tour with Regis. Or why do I keep saying Regis Aegis? I must <laughs> I must need to get my hair done again and I'm thinking of Regis Beauty or something. Um, but when I was out at Aegis was all levels of staff were so engaged with the residents. It was incredible yes. to see that. Um, and and I just give you guys kudos for that because that is not the norm um, that I have seen anyways as, as I've traveled around the country. And that is huge. That's huge. And I love how, you know, you're trying to, you know, work things out of a room when you're able to um, really understanding what is that specific need for this specific person. So thank you, Mina, for, for all you're doing. I really appreciate it. I want to get Pam in here next um, because our hour is flying by here. Now, Pam, you are Lynn's sister. So what kind of support uh, are you able to give her? And, uh, you know, when her, her memory is maybe failing and, you know, you've lived through so much together, um, but now you live in another state, how, how, do, you support, how do you support her? Um. It's all like we've been talking about technology at this point. So um, in the last, you know, since COVID, it's been very different. But one of the things that I try to do every time she and I talk is to make her laugh. And she'll call sometimes in a good mood um, and we can just laugh through things. And sometimes she'll call crying or I'll call her and she'll be crying and um, or just kind of fed up, like all done with this Mm -hmm. um and just trying to make her laugh and and talk about funny funny times funny stories humor is so powerful and i think it's one of those Mm -hmm. things that's underutilized but oh my gosh if you can leverage that and if you can get out of the what's right and what's wrong and just go with the flow and live in the moment i have so Mm -hmm. many hilarious stories of, of my mom, you know, through this journey and not laughing at her, laughing with her. She was right there in the moment and just realizing sometimes how, how silly it is for us to be as serious as we are and as controlling (laughs) that we, we want to be. And when you can, when you can release some of that and, and not have to correct and just validate and realize that someone's you know, mental state, you know, is more important. Someone's level of comfort is more important than being right or wrong in a situation, I think is is really a beautiful, beautiful life lesson. Um, What kind of care did you give Lynn uh, once you knew, you know, she was diagnosed and then moving into that decision of, you know, she can't live at home anymore? Um, more where, where I felt like she was relying on me and needing my support was leading up to the diagnosis. Um, when I was still living in Portland and I was seeing her more, I hope it's okay if I kind of shift the question. Sure, Um, sure. But it, um, she spent a lot of time talking to me about things that were going on, um, and anxieties that she was having and, my dad and I talked about this a lot, how much, and and mom, when she was with us, how much we noticed my role shifting with Lynn and that I was becoming big sister to her. And Lynn and I joked about this, that, you know, I asked her one day, I said, since when have I been your big sister? (laughs) And and we joked about it. Um, And just listening and hearing her work through things and asking questions and clarifying and saying this doesn't seem like you is there what's really going on when she was in a particularly difficult phase mm-hmm. um so and then even after she got diagnosed um i think leading up to it was 
her biggest struggle. And once she got diagnosed, I was in absolute awe of the grace with which she handled the transition of, okay, this is what it is. Now we're Mm going to move into it. And she hearing her and talking to her and, and (laughs) trying to be as accepting of it as she was, because it was tough. Yeah, I, I hear from so many people around the world, the most frustrating part is the not knowing. And once there's a name to it, at least they don't feel like they're going crazy anymore. Um, you know, yeah. there's, there's there's a name. Um, but then it's still settling into, oh, gosh, this is now associated with me, you know, taking that deep breath and, and moving mm-hmm. forward. Now, in all of this, your dad has played the primary caregiver for Lynn. How have you and your your brother and the rest of the family supported him? Because that's got to be, you know, another aspect in this whole circle of care. Yeah. Um, Again, this has looked very different in the last um, eight months. Um, So it's a lot of time on the phone and, and calling him and checking in and, um, supporting him, helping, you know, I've, I'm also a writer, so helping dad with his blog and with some other things that he's been writing related to this and talking to him about the memoir that he's writing and trying to be encouraging of that and um, just connecting as much as we can and talking about it as much as we can. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's, and, and I mean, you know, when, when I, talk to people about building these teams and these, this circle of support. It really, I mean, it's advantageous for everyone who's a participant in it, you know, because mm-hmm. everybody in the team is supporting one another, not just the person typically in terms of sharing what they've learned, what works, what doesn't work, um, what, you know, what you're seeing, mm-hmm. how you're feeling, all of those things, just knowing someone else gets it um, in itself is a, is a big, big thing. What suggestions do you have for family members or care partners who live far away from a loved one with dementia? Um, Get the technology piece working because that has been beautiful to be able to just call and see her and have her Mm -hmm. see me. So that's been a really big piece. Um, a challenge that I have had and that I have not um, worked through as well as I'd like is finding community here where I live to support with the Alzheimer's. And um, part of that has been COVID lately and previously it was my former job. But um, so I, I would say to get connected locally as well as um, finding that way to stay connected via technology um, and then just making sure that it's not just Lynn we're touching base with, that I'm calling my brother and I'm calling dad and touching base with the nephews and the nieces and that we're all just there for each other in whatever way we can be. Yep. Beautiful advice. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of our all of our panelists here. We've got about seven minutes left, and I want to uh, jump back to Jim here. And uh, see if there's anything that we've missed that you think we should cover, Jim, since you're kind of the head kahuna of of pulling all these people together (laughs) in this care team for Lynn. Yeah, I think uh, they, uh, both Edith and Simon and Pam have kind of undersold how much they do little things that help Lynn besides just the technology. Um, Edith, for example, ended up saying Lynn needs new headbands, so she sent her some headbands, and I give those, I parcel them out to Lynn at different times so that she can have a new headband to wear. And uh, Pam doing those same kinds of things, and then as she's talked about helping her brother and talking with her brother and stuff like that. And uh, you know, we talk about uh, when Mina came to us and said, "Okay, it's time for a decision." Uh, to move her out of her apartment into memory care, you know, her brother and her sister, and it's absolutely in support of that and move forward on it. Um, And I know that uh, they've all been just as concerned about Lynn's boys as uh, they've been concerned about Lynn. So they've been in communication with them and talking to them, want to make sure they're okay. And I, and I, 
they have just turned around from the real disappointment uh, that they experienced with Lynn. And uh, they're just doing extremely well in school, all three of them. And that's a turnaround for all three of them because uh, the family was there to support them at a time when they were trying to deal with their with their mother. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, it's so nice to see that you guys have all pulled together um, for, a, for a common good, a common cause. Uh, so many times, you know, I talk with, with families who aren't all on the same page, and it makes it very, very difficult um, going through this, going through this process. And, and I do think it's critical that people have one another to, to talk to um, about what they're feeling and being validated for, you know, if it's the sorrow or joy or confusion that they're going through as a, as a, as a care partner. Um, not just what Lynn is going through, but all of us go through those different emotions. And it's nice to be able to be validated and have that safe place to have that conversation so that you can kind of move through those emotions and, and, and keep, keep being there for Lynn, keep being part of that team. It's really, it's, it's a third level of, of uh, care, Laurie, because it's the one thing you care for your child, your daughter, your, your wife, your, your husband, whatever it might be, whomever. And then it's also caring for each other. But there's a third part that has, has to do with making sure that whole family, that whole team works. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've been an administrator, and uh, it, this is the same experience I had as an administrator, is realizing that part of my job, part of my responsibility as the primary caregiver is to get as many resources working with each other as possible. So it's, an, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a three-part stool for caregiving in my mind. You make sure that uh, she's taken care of. You make sure you're taking care of yourself. But then you also make sure that, that you're getting the, the advice, support, and synchronizing and coordinating the incredible talents of so many other people. I mean, it, the care is just better for Lynn because we keep sharing with each other and making each other better. I get tremendous support from the rest of them. But I felt at a point in time that my main responsibility was to make sure the family stuck together on these issues and, and not just worry about uh, Lynn. I mean, my, my wife was there to take care of Lynn in a lot of ways. And, and then I realized, you know, we were arguing with each other in ways that could have ruptured the, the relationship for the family. So I spent a lot of time just being available and trying to make sure we stayed together as a family, and then suddenly the friends showed up, like Edith and others, and it just multiplied even more. So it's important to recognize that's something we need to do and not just hope that it occurs. Exactly, exactly. Now, Jim, you have a website. Um, do you want to give people that address? Yes, it's it's all one word, nevertheless, dementia, we persist. Dot com, and uh, it's also on LinkedIn. And my name on those is uh, for Facebook and others is James S. Russell. So that's out there. And I have to throw a shout out for Simon because the reason that we uh, called it "Nevertheless We Persist" is because Simon gave her a necklace just on a spontaneous gift one time that said, "I will persist." Um, oh, wonderful! And, um, so she she has told me that she felt like a princess when she got that hung around her neck, and we have a picture of that. So oh. it's nevertheless dementia we persist dot com. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank you all for participating in the show. It's just been uh, such a valuable little nuggets that you've given to all of us, and uh, everybody's contact information is on the the page. Uh, the radio page, so feel free to reach out or contact me at Lori at AltimerSpeaks.com. And I look forward to our next show. And um, I am definitely following you, 
uh, Jim, and your writings. I, I think what you have done with this team is is uh, just fabulous. So, again, thank you all for joining us today, and don't forget to pass this episode along. Bye now. Thank you. It's time to rethink, renew, and reimagine retirement. Hey, everybody. Jared Sebesta here, host of Retire Repurposed. Now, this podcast is about the non-financial parts of retirement, which many times can be even more challenging than the financial. We believe retirement is not the end, rather the beginning of what could be the most impactful, purposeful, and fulfilling season of a person's life. So don't retire. Become repurposed. To listen now, search Retire Repurposed on your favorite podcast platform, Senior Resource, or Life Audio.